speakers today uh, talking about the neuropsychiatric effects of COVID-19. Uh, one of our speakers is Dr. Steven Zanakis, who is a retired Brigadier General of the U.S. Army. He is an adult child and adolescent psychiatrist with many years in academic and management work. He has advised the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staffs and other Department of Defense officials on psychological health, the effects of blasts, concussions, and suicide. He also worked on telemedicine applications, the development of uh, devices for electronic house calls, and research in EEG, and also was involved in the founding of the Center for Translational Medicine for developed treatments and testing for brain-related conditions affecting soldiers and veterans. He's published multiple publications um, in the areas of military medicine and is an adjunct professor at Univer Uniform Services of Health Sciences and on the board of the Center of Ethics and Rule of Law at UPenn. Dr. Zanakis is a graduate of U Princeton University and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Rocco Murata, who's a staff psychiatrist at Silver Hill and uh, affectionately known as Rocky. He runs the, uh, the Michaels House or Pervasive Psychosis Program at Silver Hill. He's also the service chief for the Transitional Living Program. Dr. Murata joined Silver Hill in 2008, around the time I came, uh, and has been really involved in doing research on patients with uh, psychosis and schizophrenia. He uh, is a graduate of Manhattan College and Cornell Medical College and did his residency training at Payne Whitney. Uh, uh, he also earned his PhD at CUNY in psychology. Uh, previously, he was a director of inpatient services at Danbury Hospital and on faculty at New York Medical College. Uh, Dr. Murata is a, is a mentor, a colleague, somebody that uh, I hold in great esteem and regard. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, both Dr. Zanakis and Dr. Uh, Murata are going to be speaking about this really important topic. But what I'd like to do first is hand it over to Dr. Gerber, the president and medical director of Silver Hill. Thank you, Amir. Um, it is a, a great pleasure. And uh, I asked Amir uh, to give me just a, a quick chance to, to say a, a few words about Stephen Rocky, just because this is an unusual circumstance. Uh, both that we're doing these things virtually these days, uh, but uh, also to have two such fantastic uh, members of our staff. Uh, Rocky, as, as most of you, I imagine, know, has been a, uh, uh, a treasured member of our staff for years now, uh, but S Steve uh, is just joining, and it gives me great pleasure that the two of them have uh, hit it off so well right away and are really kindred spirits in terms of advancing the science and the art of what it means to be a mental health professional and a psychiatrist and to uh, dive into really difficult areas where there's so much we don't know in particular about COVID, uh, yet to do so with, with such characteristic um, creativity and bravery and, uh, and enthusiasm. They're, they're, they're not only great psychiatrists, they're also both great leaders. Uh, I just, I wanna share uh, last but not least a, a metaphor that that emerged out of a conversation that we were having just yesterday. Uh, we have gotten fond of saying uh, over the last um, few months, actually, that working in the time of COVID is a little bit like building an airplane while you're flying it. Uh, and, and that and that has a quality of, of kind of learning in real time. But yesterday we, we took it to another level where we said it's actually uh, a little bit like being a paratrooper and jumping out of an airplane that you're building while you're flying it, and while the parachute is deploying, you're sewing the parachute. So, so it gives you a little bit of a quality of, of how unique and brave and creative uh, both Rocky and Steve are, and I, I feel enormously lucky that they're here at Silver Hill and that they're working with our patients and, uh, and that they're talking to us today. So on that note, we'll turn it over uh, uh, to uh, Rocky and Steve to uh, present Grand Rounds. Thank you both, and thanks everybody who joined in. This is a schematic of an electron micrograph of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is its technical name. It's the second virus of that class to break out into the population. It's just like the SARS virus. And it doesn't look like much, you know, it looks like something from Star Wars, but it's 
totally upended the world as we know it is changing everything and is affecting everyone uh, who is aware. Um, I would go on now to Stephen and we should, I guess, you know, neither he nor I have anything to reveal to you about our connections to anything uh, financial, um, but we want to take you through this quickly and bring you up to date on what's going on. So we have no disclosures and so that virus I showed you is a human coronavirus. And there are many different kinds of coronaviruses and they've always caused respiratory infections. This one is particularly dangerous. It's an RNA virus and there's lots of particulars about RNA viruses that we don't wanna go into right now, but it's related to several others that have broken out over the last 20 years. So the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus and the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, which it shares about 75% of its genome. Um, they have, this, this virus is pretty interesting. It has a very high binding affinity to angiotensin converting enzyme two. Well, why is that important? That's a receptor on most of our critical cells in our body. And it is involved also very importantly in the maintenance of blood pressure control but it's everywhere. So this virus has the ability to lock onto that receptor and get down to the cellular level and then disrupt cellular processes, right? So, and we're made up of trillions of cells and so it can disrupt them. And so it can affect the cells of the air, your airways and your lungs, the your vasculature, your kidney, your small intestines, and the central nervous system itself. So that's why there's many, many different symptoms experienced, many different kinds of uh, feeling ill by patients who are infected with the virus, okay? And of course, it has similar pathogenesis with those other viruses I have mentioned, although this one is particularly virulent. Um, Dr. Fauci, uh, was always fond of saying for years that his greatest fear, his greatest nightmare would be that a respiratory virus of this nature would break out. And so he's uh, living through, and we're living through his worst nightmare. Um, and the thing is that it has a tendency to go into the lower airway and then from the lower airway into the vasculature. And that's why we're having so much trouble controlling it. So it's it spreads relatively easily in the air, gets into the systems and has widespread effects in human beings. Can we have the next slide, please? All right, this is uh, Adam Mann and I and others. We worked on this slide a little bit, it's a little messy, but I would like you to think about that there are people who are not infected not infected by the virus, but they are affected by what's happening around them. And what they see is that people are dying and that people are getting very ill. So there's the overtly ill people, some of whom have severe infections. So of the overtly ill, a certain percentage of them get very ill. And there's a stratified vulnerability to it depending on age and other medical illnesses. But the, what's most frightening is these severe respiratory failures that people can go through. But it presents with fever, cough, fatigue, some excess production of sputum, shortness of breath, and aches and pains. But also anxiety and not feeling well. You can Some people get diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Sometimes people have headaches, brain fogs, and really severe uh, confusion, right? And when doctors look at them, they find changes in, you know, all kinds of measures in the blood that are markers of inflammation. And inflammation in the blood vessels are very critical in the severe illness. The vast majority of people, maybe even 50% of the people infected by the virus may not even know they're infected overtly. Though some things may appear later on. And then there are uh, the most people who are infected and, and ill are respiratory distress or fever, dry cough, some anxiety. It's like they had a flu and they just get over it. And most of them seem to produce antibodies. Whether or not those are neutralizing or protective antibodies is not known for sure, but maybe 
95, 98% of the people infected do, 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 do that, do make antibodies. And then again, there again, to talk about what happens to those people who are not infected. And my way of thinking about it is that everybody gets anxious, everybody is worried, everybody is under stress. And the stress is, the amount of stress you will be under depends on, you know, the environment you live in, your family, what's happened to you, what your pr previous states are, all right, and how isolated you are, how emotionally isolated and how physically isolated you can be. Uh, the next slide. And again, just to say a little bit about this idea of stratified risk, the older you are, the more likely you are to get ill, severely ill. Men are more likely to get ill than women. The average age of death in Northern Italy in the Po Valley was 80 years of age, with men coming in roughly 60% to women 40, which is interesting. And then there are pre existing medical conditions. And one of the things that we always talk about in psychiatry is the metabolic syndrome. And people who are overweight with diabetes, you know, who smoke and hypertension. It's exactly the same kinds of things that we talk about here in terms of the effect of our antidepressants and antipsychotic medicines. So our patients may be more at risk because of their lifestyle and our treatments. The people who are most at risk are people who have, you know, high risk scores, which are doctors' ways of, of uh, rating these things. But those are markers for going into septic shock and then, you know, being at risk of dying. But there are other issues which can be important, like socioeconomic and racial disparities, where you live. In Italy, uh, those people living at the higher elevations we're not having the same rates of illness. Uh, temperature may be different, the amount of sunlight and the way kinds of social systems. The Italians are always hugging and they may have spread it more, whereas the Germans don't do that and they had a much lower rate. So there are lots of things that are involved. In our own country, there's racial disparities, but they might be accounted for by economic and other issues also, all right? But so just to put it into, some context, there were genetic vulnerabilities, physiologic, experiential vulnerabilities, and social and familial, familial vulnerabilities that affect who gets ill. Next slide. And I put this slide up because the most recent data that I've been reading from every day is that there may be an underlying pathophysiological basis of why things can go so bad, which is that the virus affects those angiotensin receptors on blood vessels and the inflammation and damage to the blood vessels is why you have such variable presentations of illness. And so it might not be that the virus attacks the brain directly, but attacks the blood vessels in the brain. And this may and this may lead to us developing uh, treatments if we can understand the underlying pathophysiology. As Dr. Gerber was saying, you know we're you know we're sewing the uh, parachute as we do, or after we've jumped out of the plane here. There are committees and groups of scientists meeting every night, going over data and trying to make sense of what has been found in the last 24 hours to make decisions and try to come up with treatments. Underlying the treatments ultimately would be pathophysiology, understanding what's going on. Next slide. And this is about mortality. And, yeah, and, uh, so let me, I'd like to speak to this one, Rocky, because yeah. uh, it's a, first of all, it's because it's a privilege to be a part of this stand and uh, kind remarks from Dr. Gerber, Dr. Garkani, and to be working with you um, on it something that is so uh, important has will have such an incredible impact on this country. Uh, it, you know, we've heard this that, you know, these plagues and wars really can upend a society. And I believe that this particular pandemic will really strike the core of our society in many, many ways. And these figures as a military officer to me are really shocking, frightening. 
uh, we're looking at uh, a likelihood of about 145,000 deaths somehow by the end of this year. And think about the context that that is two and a half to three times the number of deaths we had in the Vietnam War. Uh, so, and, and rem remember how that war had such a, a, a diffuse and such a broad impact on our society in so many different ways. And this is what we're facing. We're facing a pandemic that now will share society and actually those people that we care about and we're going to need to be most concerned about as our neighbors and our front our folks on the front lines. So we are we are now in a situation that as a country we may have not we have not, and this is what calls us now to attention and it is a call to act. Uh, next slide that I'd like to speak to. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be, all right, Rock. Well, I was going to say this is one of the most interesting things to me as a New Yorker, because there were so many deaths in New York and in the nursing homes. So it, it speaks to stratified risk of people being older, but also how important it is to have a clear sense of what we're dealing with so that we don't make errors and how hard that can be, you know. But but Stephen, you've gone to this is fascinating to me. We're going to we're going to talk later about our, our campaign for resilience because it's the people in the nursing homes and it's the people helping them on the front lines uh, that we feel we should uh, make a major effort to support. Next slide. Is it, do you have it, Stephen? Coming out here, put it out by the Institute for Health uh, and Evaluation from the University of Washington. There are several models uh, that we need to think about as this plays out over the coming year. Uh, you've heard much conversation about a second wave in the fall, and if that happens with the flu, uh, uh, if we have another surge of flu again, influenza, uh, and we'll see that there's a disparity across the country. Of course, this plays into all these social factors and political factors that have to be put into the calculation of how we go about in a, an effective preventive health and public health uh, initiative. Next spec, next slide. Uh, this, this is some of the data that we look at in terms of, of the incidence of the, of the disease. And here we're coming up to an election year and this plays, we, you know, there's no way we can escape that what we do socially is going to have uh, a, a huge impact in terms of how things play out politically for us. As a military officer committed to support, defend our country in every way possible and committed to the Constitution, what's most important is the health and welfare of the country as a whole. As a physician, I believe, as a healthcare person, that's what our commitment is as well. That's what our oath is. Our oath is to make sure that we sustain and optimize the health and welfare of all Americans. Next slide. Yeah. You've got a lot to this say is, about this, I think. Yeah, this is, you know, this part of what's happened is it's, this is all happening very quickly. A new virus developing ways of treating something that we never treated before. And so, and the, as the data comes in, people are trying to, to develop responses, but there are various things that they're trying, which are kind of interesting, which is one is the people who survived it and are making antibodies might give their own blood to make plasma to treat the really severely ill. Right now, there's no specific treatments like the, the hydroxychloroquine if you're reading the newspapers that some doctors were using it, large groups of physicians, other people saying it doesn't work, other people saying it's harmful, uh, you know. So you have right in front of everyone what would have been an argument 
in the literature or at seminars are now public arguments about the effectiveness of treatments. And when in the midst of an ongoing uh, epidemic, again, rather unprecedented, okay? What we do know is that, again, most people will not get very sick, but some people do, and that becomes life threatening. And there's development of antiviral drugs. There's, you know, uh, there's large groups of, you know, scientific teams and, and even um, pharmaceutical companies developing new interventions. But yet, for most people, it comes down to rest and hydration, bring the fevers down to do something about the inflammatory response that the uh, virus induces. I mean, yesterday there was a paper released saying that, you know, steroids can help. Steroids were being used back and forth, but again, there's it's getting the evidence to prove that one thing works better than the other. And since we're in the midst of an epidemic, you know, if people could spread it. So we have to, we're now developing the use of telemedicine, doctors talking to patients at a distance, you know, and trying to make decisions, trying to decide who to treat with what, who to bring into the hospital. Hard business, hard business from day to day, you know. Um, and there's always rumors, I mean, with the with the internet and texting, there's constant rumors and stories, and who knows what's real anymore, right? Um, I mean, I've been following hydroxychloroquine myself very carefully because of, I had been sick myself, and again, you don't know what to believe. Stephen, uh, can I go on or? Yeah, yeah please, let's just uh, talk I, about it. Yeah, and I, I'll just I'll quote my dear friend, Dr. Arthur Forney, who has been running some of the response to this in several, um, you know, ICUs. He's an infectious disease expert. I was speaking to him on the phone uh, just a few days ago, and he, he said to me, he feels like the virus is constantly tricking him. But every time he thinks he understands it, it pulls another trick on him and he has to come up with more ideas. And I'm in touch with some other friends who are on committees trying to put together the, what's, you know, the natural history of this illness, its real clinical presentations, and what the responses should be under diverse circumstances. It's very hard, even though you know there's many, many cases. It's going on all over the world, and correlating and analyzing the data and making judgments about the veracity or the quality of the data is not an easy thing. It's not just saying yes or saying no. And uh, there's a, a great deal going on. Can we go to the next slide? Wow. You know, the hope is that we're going to have a vaccine. I mean, if it was a movie, you know, the, vac the, the virus would attenuate and, and go away, but really we're going to need a vaccine. And that those that work, those like 11 groups coming up working on vaccines now. And I'm told by my friends who are always hopeful that we will have a vaccine that works, uh, but not probably until after Christmas or New Year's. So it means we have a, a tough six months to go through. And even then, it's still going to be tough because, you know, getting production up to at the level of treating everybody. So as Stephen said, we're it's going to be a tough summer with the with the virus still spreading, which it, there's no way of stopping it. And then the vulnerable people uh, succumbing to it and healthcare people on every level being more and more stressed. And um, again, you know, more and more demands being made on them. We're hoping that those people who have survived that have neutralizing antibodies and we develop herd immunity. We're also hoping that there's something that this virus follows the standard FAR curve, F-A-R-R curve, and begins to attenuate. So that's an important thing, hopefully. Uh, the next slide, please. You know, again, thinking about the healthcare workers, especially those people right on the line you know the people bringing food in the nursing homes the the aides uh the the er staffs 
and on units, you know, with a large numbers of patients and very high viral loads, you know, what is it like to be in that position? The anxiety and the fear, the word anxiety, outright fear. I mean, I've spoken to lots of younger doctors and nurses who have been fearful about it. You know, if you're a nurse or a doctor or an aide, you have a very high expectation of how you yourself should be able to behave and carry yourself. That's a, that's a real hope. Yet you fear failing, right? You fear giving into that fear. And the healthcare workers have a great deal of knowledge, right? They have a great deal of knowledge that can be helpful to them, but also can be pretty scary uh, and, and containing those fears. So I put down the word denial. Um, you know, I, I, I was raised in the Roman church and I've always thought that there would be no civilization without the denial of human nature, <laughs> you know, that people go on no matter what and they continue to care for each other. And this is a case where you have to be able to deny the worst parts of the fear to go on, care for yourself and care for others. There's a degree of, you know, of being able to maintain hope in any situation. I do not think this is a hopeless situation at all. As a species, we've been through much worse things, but this is again where it's an interesting phenomenon that plays through the individual you know, psychology of people. The people, the healthcare workers have very high workloads, very high expectations, tremendous senses of responsibility. They're trained to be competent, but they also fear failure. Failure to them could be catastrophic in terms of self image, right? Now, in my generation, and I think in Stevens, we a lot of us were pre inoculated to the kinds of stresses by having you know, working 36 hour shifts. And I was trained as a physician when there was still that medical students and residents and interns sometimes died on the units of infections they would catch. And that began to stop, I think, in the, in the uh, 1980s. And so there was the generation that trained us was very inoculated that you did things despite risk. And the older doctors have that pre-inoculation, and I think the younger staffs have less of it, and I just think it's an interesting phenomena. So the question is, if you can't be pre-inoculated by exposure to stress, can you be vaccinated to uh, deal with it? And that is a matter of education. We vaccinate with ideas, right, uh, with, uh, with learning. And so that's just some ideas I'm throwing out for us uh, to think about. Um, let's go on to, to Stephen now with the resilience campaign because well, that's part of what is about. Off roughly from what you're saying. So that's the basis of a campaign that uh, Silver Hill uh, has a year uh, uh, in terms of supporting the resilience and the strength of the people who are on the uh, you've pointed to a couple things already, and I know that the analogy can be stretched too far between plagues and wolves. Um, uh, but we know that with this particular pandemic, uh, we could move on to the next slide. Uh, with this particular pandemic, uh, as uh, that there is a certain uncertainty of how it's going to play out, that that really wears and tears on people. Uh, that there is a particular population that is extremely vulnerable. Uh, we heard that yesterday in the remarks of the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, of how the people that are, uh, again, the very working class that struggling many times to survive are the ones that are going to be hardest hit, uh, that this is dynamic. And as a military officer, you know, we've seen this before, and that's why we do scenario planning. I mean, we didn't know, I came in during the Vietnam War, we didn't know how that was going to play out day to day. And look at the past 18 years of Iraq and Afghanistan. We've not known how that's going to play out. Who has it affected? It's affected in many ways those soldiers uh, on and Marines, those people on the front lines. And that's what we've got here, what we have in this situation. We need to think about that. We need to do some scenario planning and we need to proactively, uh, as we're trying to do in this campaign, support those people on the front lines. And that's our 
nurses in the nursing homes, the aides, the police officers, the first responders, uh, anybody there that uh, makes our lives kind of move on day to day. Now, without them, of course, as we've all seen, uh, our lives are much more constrained and a lot more difficult. So next slide. Accordingly, we've put together this campaign that we're talking about resilience. How do we keep people functioning as the best that they can? Uh, make sure that uh, they're able to, uh, to feel that they're taking care of themselves. Uh, and in taking care of themselves, they're taking care, they're doing their jobs and taking care of the people that they're, they're supposed to be taking care of. Uh, they need to have tools and, and uh, need to be, in that sense, as Rocky was saying, trained to be able to manage the adversities uh, that they're facing that lots of times they don't even know. And even if they don't know, after a while they get tired of uh, it. And they, this stuff kinds of bears down on them. And they do, in fact, encounter some tragedies. I mean, I don't know, in the communities that I'm now living here in, in Florida, we've had a huge number of deaths in nursing homes. Uh, and how many times these people are dying by themselves. And those aides and those nurses and those doctors that are with them uh, really find themselves grieving in ways that they had never quite imagined that they would. Next slide. So the best basis is there are some particular rules. I'm going to go through a set of slides that you can pick up on the PDFs at the end of this talk. Uh, many of the things that uh, we've all heard about, but it's kind of not like what you do, it's how you do it. It's really how you make these things part of your life, how you learn to take care of yourself, how you learn to be able to make the decisions uh, that you need to and prioritize what you do for yourself and your family and for the people that you're taking care of, how you learn to keep things in perspective uh, and to adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Next slide. Uh, what we've done is in a, we've put together a major campaign for resilience, a campaign that we want to to deliver to all these frontline people that otherwise would really not have these tools and uh, uh, management uh, coping mechanisms uh, at hand so they can go about in their jobs and in their lives. There's a lot of material out there. There's a lot of information, uh, but what needs to happen is to format it in the way that these people can use it. My experience as a military officer is that we at as commanders, as senior officers, talk a lot about the strategies. We talk a lot about the plans, but what we've got to do is figure out what that soldier on patrol, what that soldier on the front lines really needs that's going to be most useful. And that's making it simple. That's making it practical. That's making it something that they can relate to so that they're going to use that soldier, that individual, that man and woman that's out there defending our country, doing what we need to do, has got something that they need, they can use every day and make sense to them and they feel good about. And that's what this campaign is about. It's taking that stuff. It's not esoteric. It's not about the ideas. It's about what's most useful to these folks as they go about with their work and in their daily lives. Next slide. Uh, and next slide. So our focus is on supporting the frontline people, training them on coping, training them on resilience, training them on stress management. We know that there's a lot out there. So like any, I mean, we've learned this so many times in anything we do at a ground level is you got to fill in gaps. There's a lot of things out there. And part of what the first step is sort of doing a reconnaissance, sort of talking to people, engaging them, figuring out what really is most important to them, what they need, and customizing the tools that you have so that they get to fill in 
what's missing and they can go about and do their jobs and live their lives. Next slide. With, um, and we've said this in the military for years after years, it's about working smarter, not about working harder. At a time when there's a lot of stress, at a time when things are like they look frantic, where you don't know, there's so much uncertainty, where you don't know what how things are going to play out. You have to rethink your day. Think about, about your daily routines, all the things I take care of myself. It's important to optimize my functioning. And if I'm going to optimize my functioning, I've got to work. Look at everything I'm doing now and and rethink it in terms of this particular so the challenges that we're encountering and prior, encountering and prioritize it. Do they really make sense? What's important in terms of what I'm trying to do, in terms of the people I'm trying to help, in terms of the way that I'm trying to stay strong and keep my teammates strong, what do I really need to do? And I, I think it's a good rule of thumb, a good maxim. Always ask yourself, am I working smarter? Or am I working harder? Because it's best to work smarter. Next slide. And in that sense, we don't know how it's going to play out, but the numbers that we've talked about so far, we should be planning a good scenario is that this is going to play out for another year. That means people are going to get tired. That means different people in different ways over that period of time. That means it's going to come and go. And people are at some point going to feel relief and all of a sudden it's back. We're back in the same situation. It's Groundhog Day. How did this happen? I thought I had this solved. Well, these what these this is the challenge of operations. In some ways this country hasn't seen something like this that's been on our soil, that has involved us and so many over such a long time, probably since World War II, where the whole country had to be involved to mobilize, to defend against those enemies, against our, and to preserve our democracies. So this is a long-term, you know, uh, operation. And with that, it, it requires people to think about it uh, in, in, in and the possible scenarios that will play out over the coming year. Next slide. Leadership some standard uh, tactics that it can use, and it's so important to train leadership here at all levels. And that they are the, they accordingly take care of the people and support their people on the front lines. Uh, and so that they can do their work as effectively as possible. We have formatted our programs to educate and train leaders because it's the leaders that are so important to helping and supporting those frontline people, nurses, police, uh, firefighters, first responders. Next slide. Now, that fundamental to good leadership is what we call command climate. And that is morale. We're all in this together. We're all here to, to support each other. We're all here to understand that we have good days and bad days. We're all here to team up and that we talk amongst ourselves. And with that, when one of us seems to be falling back, we start to reach out to us. You know, in medicine, and particularly in psychiatry, we like to think like it's a post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not a disorder. It's what we learned, in fact, in Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. 
anybody in a long-term costing operation or another is going to get injured. There are days that are going to be harder than other days. And it's an understanding that that's just hard, and hard work. And that's why we're out there and we're supporting each other because we get tired, because we feel like we've been hurt. But we know that we can recuperate and we can get back onto the field. We can get back to our jobs and we can do what is right and good for everybody. Next slide. What we've done is we've put these reformatted and we've got a great team here. I want to shout out to the team that our, our COVID resilience campaign, and that's Tara Reed, uh, who's our operations leader, and Amy Jett, who's done a lot of this formatting work, and Georgia Nagel, who's done a lot of the writing and gone through the material, and Cheryl Bundy, the chaplain, and Jen uh, Morabito, who's really kind of made the trains run for us, uh, as well as the support of Dr. Gerber and a lot of the staff at Silver Hill. This is a team and all the folks have come together and they've said, let's let's put our, our time and energy, our best ideas out. And this is what we've done. We've produced some materials. You can find them on the Silver Hill website. There are other resources that we're making available and we want to get them out to the community. So the folks that we know are our families, taking care of our school children, taking care of everything we need every, every day, have this material information available to them and get, get trained to do the best their jobs and, you know, take care of themselves. Listen. These are some checklists that we put together. Uh, you can see them when you get the slides. Next slide. Specifically, we think that law enforcement, particularly at this time, uh, really can get uh, some additional support. There's a lot of, as we all know, looking at how things are playing out uh, uh, for law enforcement. There's a tremendous amount of stress that they're under and everything we can do to support them, make them most effective uh, is uh, I think a shared responsibility that we all have. And we're gonna make a, a effort to uh, do what we can and talk to them and help them as they go through uh, what might be some pretty tough months ahead of selection. I hate to think about it, but uh, from 1968 when I was in college, uh, and the world blew up there uh, during that. Now, but uh, I, in the best world, best scenario planning, uh, we need to think uh, through that, remember that, and support those folks on the front line. Our medical people were giving them these tools. Again, this team put together some great stuff. Uh, that we're able to deliver to them, put in their hands. Next slide. Move into what it means for us as psychiatrists, uh, and I'll turn it over to Rocky, but context is this uh, uh, for people to think about. Uh, we've probably had at this point two million Americans who've been infected. Uh, and to describe uh, what the uh, neuropsychiatric, what the cognitive effects are. If only 5% of those people have some kind of chronic sequelae, that's 100,000 people, a lot of folks. with as possibly uh, for the rest of their lives in one way or another. Well, I remember that. I remember that from Agent Orange. I remember the PTSD from Vietnam. I remember all the soldiers and Marines who have been on patrols in Iraq and Afghanistan and have suffered IED blasts and have concussions. And I've seen how that's changed their lives. 
sometimes in horrible ways. And I think that we're responsible as healthcare folks to be proactive about it. We don't know a lot about this disease. I understand we don't know a lot about the patho pathology, but there is a lot that we do know, and there's a lot that we can do to help. And that's our responsibility, I feel. And maybe one of the changes of this pandemic, as we've seen, this could be transformational for medicine. Uh, it could be transformational, of course, in the delivery we've seen with telemedicine. It could be transformational in the way that we collect the information and think about how we apply science, how science informs us. Well, here's a chance to take knowledge that we have, knowledge that we know that helps people who have injuries and impairments and now help those who are suffering with the consequences of this illness. But that's the kind of work that Rocky and the team do at Silver Hill. So I now we'll, we'll turn it over to you, Rocky, to talk about this a bit more. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting that the military analogy, because to me, that's what it was like when I was first coming up through medicine in graduate school and medical school and training, because I did that during the AIDS epidemic. I entered before we knew what was going on and we were in the state of confusion trying to make sense of it. And what the prevailing feeling state was of staff was worry and anxiety. And I keep using that, you know, as a phrase because it keeps coming back to me that we had talked about, you know, the 1950s was the age of anxiety. Well, here we are again in another age of anxiety, dealing with the unknown in dealing with the dangerous. But these are some of the changes, the pathophysiological changes that occur with this virus. People trained in medicine think about what's the underlying pathology? What does the virus do? How does it affect the body as a functioning system? And they think in terms of subsystems, and they think in terms of the, the brain, the heart, the vasculature, the lungs, etc. And on this slide, that Adam and I just threw together, you know, I just try to put some of them down to think about it, right? If the virus inflames certain tissues, there's an inflammatory response. And what can happen in lots of illnesses is that the body's response to an assault can do more damage than the virus itself. The attempt to destroy the virus destroys the tissue. And on slide on the left hand side inflammation autoimmune reactions i say well, there's a high crp srd dimers a and a those are the same things that go up for example in autoimmune diseases like lupus that's what happens when you have very severe assaults on the body you know, fever pain inflammation and if the inflammation gets out of control then you get damage to organs and then you're in a very difficult situation and that's why it's hard to know where you are along the course of the illness neurologically if you think of you know i always think of the nervous system is us the nervous system you know what's at risk with this virus is your being and your being comes from your brain the sense of self and that's what's at risk and when you when you're at risk you feel anxious you feel uncomfortable and how does that play through well you develop a case of adhd right you develop poor concentration disruption of memory emotional control. When it's really severe, you can get confusional states because if the virus is attacking the brain directly or say the cardiovascular system or the lungs, you have poor oxygenation and people get confused. And again, there's these feelings of pain and weakness, pain, weakness, anxiety. You get decreased cardiac function, you feel anxious, right? You have, when your heart rate goes up, you, you feel anxious, you can you have to regain control. And there's always that idea that early in the virus, many, many people complain of pain. And here's this the fascinating thing, which was that people say, and I experienced this in my wife and family members because we actually had the virus, which is that because of the complexity of its attack on the body, you may have difficulty with oxygenation, that is your, the efficiency of your lungs, and you have a decreased oxygen level and you don't know it. It's only when it gets very severe that you begin to know that something's wrong. 
And think about knowing about that and worrying about that if that's what's happening. Rather interesting experience. Uh, uh, that's why denial sometimes is good for you, that you don't know how bad it can be. And think of the interplay between what's happening physiologically and then what's happening psychologically. You know, you're anxious, your heart rate goes up. The virus attacks the heart directly, your heart rate goes up. You feel anxious because of that. It attacks your lungs, you're over-breathing, you're, you're getting confused, you're, something's off that makes you anxious. The anxiety worsens your response. You, have, you, know, you feel sick because it attacks your, you know, your GI system. You feel nauseous, you're developing headaches. You can't concentrate, you know something is wrong. You're producing more steroids, the virus is interfering. It's like one of those perfect storms, not only for the society as a whole, but for the individual's body and the response of uh, the individual. Uh, now, you know, what you do for it is you, the body needs inflammation to fight the virus. Too much inflammation destroys the body. You, you, you may go on steroids to help control it. The steroids might make it worse. Very delicate measured responses that have to be measured out for any given individual. This is not something I think where um, you you know exactly what to do for patients. You have to decode it. And to me, it's very much like treating psychiatric patients. You know, there's a textbook that gives guidelines, but every patient is an experiment in themselves. Um, that's what uh, my friend Dr. Chacon told me. It's like every patient he's treating in the ICU becomes another problem that has to be decoded. Um, some of the guys I know who are putting together these, these clinical descriptions. They're trying to categorize the patients in, in groups, but again, there's so much variability, there's no easy answer. Can I, can I have the next slide? Now, psychiatry is neuropsychiatry, and just to go over some of the neuropsychiatric effects, the virus, what many people described initially is these headaches, headaches and brain fog. Uh, that can occur even with mild and moderate infections. It might even occur in people who don't get overtly ill. They just might have a headache and not think nothing of it. Or people with migraines may have a worsening migraine picture and just think it's another migraine, you know. The altered smell and taste is absolutely fascinating to me. That was my first symptom. Uh, I didn't, nothing tasted right to me. And then I began to get sick a few days later. Confusional states like delirium are what occur in, later on in progression of severe illness. So I just want to make this clear that a lot of the data that originally has come in is the data from the really sick patients in the hospital and in the ICUs. What we don't have a clear picture of is what are the experiences of people with mild cases or subclinical cases that may have other effects on mood, you know, like, in other words, like depression or the ability to think clearly and or what the virus would do to people who have illnesses already, say neuropsychiatric illnesses, will it worsen it, will it cause exacerbations, would cause re, like will bipolar patients have an episode because they, they've been affected. This is just not clear yet, but the virus may get directly into the brain, to the nasal cavity, it may get indirectly into the brain, through the tissues or through the lungs. It may cause, you know, the hypoxia again, the metabolic derangements are probably critical to seeing really severe disruption of behavior and consciousness. By the time you're in the ICU, 60% of the patients are having psychiatric diagnoses, but it's mostly confusional states and changes in cognition. Um, and one of the interesting things, I don't know, is that you can have effects that last for many weeks or months after you've been infected, right? That does can be reported. Um, and one of the things that is being reported to everyone I know treating patients is it, fatigue. Fatigue and inability to sustain concentration like they used to. So it has that like sort of a chronic fatigue kind of picture or, or a chronic Lyme infection kind of picture becomes uh, uh, 
you know, noticeable in patients. Um, with severe infections, you get encephalopathies, encephalitis, meningitis, seizures, glane barre Those, that's not so much what we'll get, we're going to be dealing with here. But again, I think we're also going to have, I love what Stephen said about, you know, post-traumatic stress disorders. Well, it's something we're all going to have to deal with. Is it a disorder or is it part of what it means to be alive and uh, deal with deal with things? Um, can I have the next slide? This is the brain at risk slide, okay. Um, I don't want to beat this up, but this is to, just to give you an idea of how things may progress over time. We don't know. Is the virus neurotropic and will it damage things? There's some early evidence that affects the hippocampus, which the hippocampus is involved in putting down memories and the hippocampus is disrupted in, in dementias. So is that a possibility? That would be a horror show. There's some, if a patient has Parkinson's disease and got the virus, they would get worse, for, right? Will that be sustained? Is it due to the virus or is it due to the inflammation or the decrease in oxygen tension? Again, we're not sure. Uh, lots of bits of information we hear in the media, but not a detailed study of, of what is actually going on. Uh, but I, for my way of thinking in terms of neurological manifestations, is there another slide now after this one? Yeah, you know, it, the, the respiratory things and the changes in the blood, blood vessels may turn out to be critically involved in this. And then the issues will be, can we develop treatments behavioral treatments, pharmacological treatments, uh, you know, environmental treatments will help people get better, will help them heal faster and be able to continue to work efficiently. And how, again, do we deal with the stress reactions of our own staff members uh, all the time? I want to leave some time for uh, questions, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, moving forward, uh, I think I've essentially said this, but there's all kinds of things that play out here, as both Stephen and I have said, you know, the idea that loss of income, fear, death of friends and relatives, very, very hard to deal with. And there's, again, working class people and lower middle class people are particularly vulnerable to the economic changes, but also to the effects of the virus itself. I was looking at the maps for New York City by zip code, and you'll note that the highest rates of illness occur in the outer boroughs, which is interesting, where working class people have to use the subways and buses to get to work. And so many people work in healthcare and they were infected where they work. They were infected on modes of transportation and they brought it back to their communities where people are living higher densities. It's a critical kind of thing. And now on top of it, they've lost income. They've lost their jobs. Um, and that is something we're going to have to deal with. So many of our frontline people do not make big incomes and will need lots and lots of help. And then we see what's going on now with reduced you know, access to not only mental health care, but so many in this, this region, so many people like a relative of mine had cancer and could not continue with their chemotherapy. Uh, lots of people didn't get surgery. There was not follow up on lots of people with many illnesses over the last three to four months. This is all going to have a cascade of effects through uh, the country and we as healthcare providers are have to, going to have to deal with this on many, many uh, different levels. Um, I thought I'd take a moment to just talk about what I went through in my life. I think one of the hardest things of having it, again, is not knowing what would happen. So I knew a great deal about the virus. I been studying it even before I got sick. Um, and just waiting for something to go wrong or possibly go wrong was incredibly disruptive intrapsychically. Uh, to be watching my temperatures and my, uh, my oxygenation levels changing and worrying about it, you know, every four hours getting anxious as I was looking at the uh, screen, being really anxious as I looked at the thermometer, 
then having a sense of relief and going through that over and over again. Uh, you know, going over, and then of course, we, I seem to get better when we all seem to get better, then worried about would we show the pattern of getting really sick again, say seven or 10 days later. So it, it was a quite emotionally disrupting experience. Uh, and it's had, I think, a lasting effect on me in terms of my ability to concentrate <laughs> and stay focused. It was enormously disruptive. I'm just putting that out so you're aware that it's no, just... But, but you see, if I, if, I could for a second, if I could for a second, I think, it, yeah. if I could for, for a second, I think, Don, is, you're like a teaching case. And amazingly, of course, you're a very bright, talented individual. You've got all these resources available to you, but here you are, you've, you've observed and now you've shared with us. Imagine what it's going to be like for many, many other people that in fact don't know what you know. And how they're going to have to, even very bright, capable people that are in other lines of work, understand what's happening here, what that's going to mean for them. And you've got these compounding sort of toxic effects piling on about fear, anxiety, hypoxia, a bit of impairment there, all the problems. And I think what we'll see is uh, people as if they're looking as if they're depressed and maybe a bit cognitively impaired or, or anxious, uh, irritable, having problems in their lives. Uh, all these things are going to be uh, factored in to how they are now seeking, hopefully seeking help. And what I think our responsibility is to think about that, is to ask ourselves, knowing that all those factors are at play, how do we move forward and support them and probably have a more patient-focused, integrative program out there knowing that people are going to have all these all these symptoms uh, and, and problems in their lives what can we do to think to be moving forward and, and towards help them i think that's the next phase of, in our and, and yeah. uh, uh we need to be able to uh, take that on and it's what we can do to help as we all go through the next year and this particular challenge that we have as a country. Yeah, I think that's going to play out over the next six months in, in ways that we should anticipate, which is there's not only the danger of the virus coming back in the fall, but a kind of general exhaustion appearing in the population uh, over time. And I re remember when we were Back in medical school, they they, they had these uh, the, the idea of the general adaptation syndrome distress, and when you're under large right. amounts of stress for extended periods of time, there can be a collapse because of the body's response to the stress and the hormones over an extended period of time. And there was there was research in that during the Korean War and during the Vietnam War, and it one of the Fascinating things to me was that officers showed a much worse response because their their stress levels were much higher and more sustained over time, and uh, they they had a tendency to show worsening physiological disruption by the stress over time. But it doesn't it didn't appear immediately. It appeared months and months later, and uh, I'm sort of worried about that being an issue that people will. You know, yeah. have the thousand yards there. I share that worry with you. And let me tell you what what we also had, what we've got out of Iraq of Afghanistan is these IED blasts have probably injured the brains and the in although it's you'd say it's a different cause, but in much the same way that this virus is probably also affecting and injuring the brain. So you've got these cumulative, like you pointed to, you've got these cumulative effects that I think we'll see downstream and we'll, we'll clearly have, people will we'll ask ourselves now, is this COVID syndrome? Is this what, what's happened here? And, uh, you know, look, I, I believe that uh, we've, we have a responsibility as a profession 
to try and prevent as much as we can to get ahead of it, to think about it before it's in our face. And maybe we've had an unfortunate increase in suicides or other kinds of, of problems and in people's lives. Um, well, I don't know if you wanted to go on, Rocky, or other. Well, I, th I think we should bring that up because that's happening around us, if we can believe the figures. High, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of drug abuse. I think that we will be faced with very high needs to admit patients over the next months, which are going to, again, strain uh, the system. And our, our group of people now, it's, you know, it's not going to be, you know, the women and men in the ICUs that are going to be strained so much as it's going to be us with them, right? I mean, Arthur told me that he hasn't intubated a patient in three weeks after having 17 patients at a time intubated. And, you know, uh, Eugene told me the same thing. It's, so it's changing. That's changing. But now we will deal with the the more subtle disruptions. And one of the interesting things was just what four days ago, today's 17th. So in the New England Journal, there was the, the pathology paper on the neuropathology paper. And now I thought they were going to tell me that the virus was in, you know, the amygdala and the frontal lobe preferentially, but they found that it wasn't. It was diffuse damage to blood vessels. You know, so it's a diffuse disorder that's showing up everywhere, at least at this level of analysis, you know. Um, and that means, again, it could present anyway. And it, we won't know what it is. And when the AIDS epidemic came out, you know, we, we didn't know what we were seeing. And then one of the phrases that was passed around was that HIV disease was the great imitator. It could imitate anything. And at the generation before us, the great imitator was lupus, right? Uh, that lupus could present as any disorder. And then, so we studied lupus to figure out how HIV would present. I think I'm waiting for the next paper to come out, you know, in, in uh, the American Journal of Psychiatry of, you know, of uh, COVID or whatever they're going to call it being a great imitator, you know, another psychiatric sure. imitating disease. I think that's the next paper that comes mm -hmm. out. Um, mm -hmm. But we should take some questions, I guess. Was yeah, I think we should take some questions. People want to uh, post them. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is going to happen. Thank you, Adam. To our Thank you, Adam. This is very different than a formal thing. I was just reading. I went to some last year. Because you really do this at very formal description. I, I don't see any questions. Are there any questions from our audience, or the, how are they posting them? I think this, there may be that delay, Stephen. They would say there's a. Right. Can you click on the Q and A link to see? Um, Show Q. Did I do it right? Yeah. Open before. Okay. You have to reconnect. I guess I see. I see uh, Helen. Oh, okay. Erwin okay. Gelman is, I think, the first at twelve twelve that I see. Okay, so. All right. I don't see any questions. I don't see any questions. Maybe I, I maybe I'm not doing I, it I right. Just, I'll do see, it again. I can see Irwin's. Rocky, do you want to read out Irwin's? Yeah, Irwin says. Can either of you address the phenomenon of healthcare professionals, such as several of our psychiatrists at Silver Hill, working from home, seeing our patients via telemedicine while sick ourselves with COVID? Have there been analogous situations in the past, or is this a new phenomenon? Well, I guess I could say, Erwin had it, I had it, so I was in bed and um, on the telephone with patients and running team meetings still, which is interesting. I felt intact enough to work and actually emotionally needed to work to not feel as ill as I might. Uh, is there ever been analogous things analogous to that? I suspect that if we could have spoken to the 
physicians in Venice during the plague epidemics of the Renaissance, there might be stories of them working with patients while ill, and maybe since they couldn't enter the houses, yelling through the windows. I don't, I don't know. I mean, well, I'll tell you about one thing, Rob. Uh, because what we deploy our not just psychiatrists into the combat zone as well, right? So they're there. I Meaning, even though they're not going out on patrols, but particularly in these wars in both Vietnam and in Iraq, Afghanistan, where we haven't had fronts like we did in World War II. So these men and women have been under attack and threatened just like soldiers. And what I've seen is lots of times and what I felt that we needed to do as senior officers was how this can play out sort of in a split way. The that that stress, I mean, you've talked a lot about it, right? The fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty. I'm completely with my soldiers. I've got to do what I need to do no matter what. And, and then you've got the other group that is saying, hey, toughen up, you know, suck it up, take care of it. And that we almost lose what I would consider a healthy middle ground. I think it's exhausting for everybody. And I need to understand that these kinds of operations that go on for a long time uh, in a hospital like this, in a nursing home, in a general hospital are exhausting. And, and, it, and, the, and when you do that, when you tire out and pressure your staff, uh, they tend to react sometimes and uh, that are not the best. And you have to pay attention to it. I think our responsibility as leaders is to pay attention. And that's what we're trying to train our folks. That's part of our... Well, I think the police are really going to feel that. I mean, mm. uh, in terms of these demonstrations, are they with the demonstrators or are they against the demonstrators? Are these, you know, is this peaceful? Is it not peaceful? Is it disruptive? Is it not disruptive? Look, these things cause splitting. We understand splitting. And we've got to do what we need to do in order to support everybody and be, think and be thinking about it and talk about it amongst ourselves. So that's how I've seen it play. Like, yeah. Yeah. Responsibilities lead. I think one thing I've noticed. Stephen, with working on screens with patients is given what I do, it's harder to make decisions because that I, I can't read the eyes. I can't read the facial expression quite well. I don't see how the body moves. And one of the fascinating things, and this is for Amir and others, because I think there's a great paper here, is that we've been keeping up with the patients who are on the oxytocin and the clozapine. I've been keeping up with them and their families by, you know, doxy. And the patients with more paranoid illnesses don't want to be seen on doxy. Their, their computers always fail. So they can see me, but I can't see them. And so I, you know, the defensive structures coming out of, and I, under the stress, because I think when you talk, you know, Imagine if you have an illness in which you're feeling cut off and vulnerable already, and then the whole world around you becomes like this. I, I, it's, I think it's even more frightening. And I think we're gonna, when it loosens up a little bit and people are able to move, we'll see that change. And I also think that they, people need to be touched and seen, you know, and to be, to. It, Physicians need to be there. I don't know what happens when a physician is re reduced to like an algorithm asking questions, right? That some of the human part of it gets cut off. Uh, it, it's like discussion on Blade Runner, you know, about the meaning of what, is it, what does it mean to be human? Um, and I, I don't know if that answers Irwin's well, question. Well, but let me, there's another riff. I mean, since we're, we're in this freewheeling environment in this with all these electrons. Uh, let me just kind of riff off of that. What you're talking about is the people who are most, sometimes struggling the most, are the least 
uh, uh, feel the most isolated. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to engage. You know what I saw in the VA with suicide would be that, that sometimes these people would get blamed. Yet they were the ones that were the most struggling, and in fact, they probably were the ones that made the most serious suicide gestures and or killed themselves. We've got to rethink something in our profession. I mean, we've talked over the years about those people that are treatment resistant and comply with recommendations and all that. There's a reason for that. And what you've talked to is those sometimes who they're most severely impaired. And then feeling in some way the most distanced in a world of social are likely to be able to engage the way that we want them to engage. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we do here, I think, that's more proactive. So I, I don't know if there's other questions. I can't for some reason. Yeah, there's a specific question about the opening of restaurants outdoor eating, tennis courts, et cetera, you know, in in this community. The, the question is, I think this insinuates that risk of contracting the virus or spreading it has lessened. Should we avoid these areas? So, um, so you're asking me for us to make a, a judgment. Is, is the risk less now? Uh, well, I, I have an opinion, but I wouldn't necessarily want to, people to make their own personal decisions about my opinion, you know, which is look at the numbers and try to make sense of what's happening around us. Uh, but I don't think if I had to make a decision about my own children, my mother, about what to do now, I would still be careful, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't have, I, I can't read everything either, you know, literally or metaphorically right now. We're at a point where I suspect in the next 14 days, we will know much more about whether or not, you know, the opening up makes sense. I, um, I've got nothing to say about it, Rocky. I don't know. I mean, I live in a community where things have opened and um, infections. Uh, and so I've, you know, each of us has to make uh, yeah. circumstances. You know, our age, other illnesses, all sorts of things like that. So uh, I, I, I think that's what we're left with. Yeah, I think you have to deal with uh, what I kept stressing was the stratif stratified risk, right? Um, and if you, if you're over a certain age and you have certain medical conditions, I would be very, very careful. I mean, I have friends I've told yeah. to not go anywhere, you know, literally yeah. stay totally isolated. And um, there are other people, I don't think it's such a problem for, for right now. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things in my family is that a whole bunch of us getting it and surviving it mean that we uh, have had it and have antibodies. And now, um, right. you know, some people say, well, are, you want to say, well, I'm invulnerable, I can't get it again. But then we don't know if that's true. And would getting it a second time be worse than the first time or easier? No one knows. So you can't you can't latch on to what would be like when we were kids, you know, having the measles or the chicken pox. You had it once and then you're not going to get it again. We don't know this is brand new. And so it's hard for anyone to say really knowledgeable. You know, things have changed. Hydroxychloroquine worked. It didn't work. It doesn't. I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. Is there, there another question? I can't see. Yeah. I only see. Are there others coming in, or can Jane? Can you see them? Yes. If you scroll down, Rocky, you'll see um, a few more. In particular, the isolation experienced by seniors who are asked to remain sheltered and are fearful of entering back into society. Oh yeah, I think that's absolutely horrible. I mean, in the midst of this whole thing, I mean, I had personal experience with this. My mother-in-law, who's a, who will be 99 Saturday, was 
still a vigorous person, you know, reads the New York Times every day and argues with me about politics um, and was still performing, <laughs> you know, and had at art shows. I mean, we were not allowed to see her and she was alone with an aide in her apartment in New York for these months. And, you know, so her children, her grandchildren, her great grand, no one could see her. And that was just terrible, even though there was, you know, Zoom and things. Um, and my mother had a mild stroke in the midst of this uh, and had to be taken to the hospital. And for, and, and for her to be alone and away from her children and grandchildren was just horrendous. You know, she was insisting she was fine. There was nothing wrong with her and she was going to walk out. <laughs> you know? And they had to say, you know, you can't leave yet. And, and she's doing well. But again, that, that's, that was horrible. And speaking to friends and family members who were locked up. I mean, one of my very closest friends is like a brother to me had an illness. He is a doctor and he he was not allowed to leave uh, where he was sequestered. And that was three months, three months locked up. I mean, he's continued to work on his research and on, you know, he's an infectious disease expert, worked vigorously like hours a day, but was alone. I thought that was remarkable that, you know, that commitment to the work on one hand, but I would have, I don't know what that would have been like for me. I was lucky enough to be ill in a house with four other ill people. <laughs> so I had people to talk to. <laughs> Uh, so I wasn't isolated as much as other people might be. I was cared for by my friends and family. They would leave me, you know, food and homemade bread on the on the on my doorstep. So, <laughs> so I had a sense of connectedness, and I could yell across, you know, the backyard to neighbors. But, uh, but boy, for some people, it must have been just horrendous. And the poignant story, I people whose elderly grandparents died in nursing homes and they weren't allowed to have funerals. That was just heartbreaking, you know? Uh, and again, that was, that's not the way the world's supposed to be, right? And that's, and there's all those stories, there's terrible stories and terrible suffering. Uh, we, we did, I mean, my experience was, okay, it was just another experience, you know? But that, that for me, that's what that was. Like. There is one more question. Does About, the campaign only fund services to frontline workers or do you eventually see expanding to treat COVID survivors with lingering psychological effects? I think that's what we have to do. I think that's the hospital's role is to learn to diagnose and treat, which means that we have to learn a new maybe language and a new treatment modalities. And, you know, we may even have to developing, Stephen and I have been talking about this, we, we have to develop protocols for making diagnoses and making sense of it. And we may have to come up with various treatments over time that are helpful. I mean, what's most annoying to me is to my decrease in the ability to concentrate. And uh, for me, is my writing skill seems to be quite off, especially writing poetry. It's like it whacked my rhyming center uh, and I desperately want to find a drug to return my rhyming center you know <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> uh, but there, I mean there's one last question if we have time have the methods of media coverage of the pandemic and associated medical information negatively affected public health Stephen, you're uh, a politician. Uh, I should answer that. Uh, well, I mean, has it increased fear and anxiety? Uh, and in a world now where you've got all these other factors that also are aggravating fear and anxiety and maybe causing more tension, in that sense, it, it has. I and mean, uh, the, there's an art here, and we have found it over the many years in military medicine, uh, there's an our family members informed, right? They need to know enough what they need to know the right information so that they can manage the uncertainty of what they're facing. But then again, it has to be 
presented to them and understandable so it doesn't aggravate their fear and anxiety. And I, I think that there's a responsibility here by all of us, uh, clearly our government officials, to do that. Uh, because this is going to be here for a year, if not longer. And uh, it's affecting all our lives in all these different ways. And I think that that's, uh, that's the only way to be uh, effective and to be supportive of our communities is to give them the right information at the right time in the right way and of course that's what we also think is our part in doing our our resilience campaign mm -hmm. jake could you see more there's a lot of people saying they can't see the question so can't figure out how to use it i guess yeah and um, no i think we are now uh, concluded uh, Dr. Garakani, I'll pass over to you for closing. Hello. Thank you uh, to Dr. Zanakis and Dr. Murata. I thought that was a really stimulating and uh, important uh, discussion. Uh, I apologize. I should have said up front that you can ask questions on there's a Q&A bar. Um, I know it's a little mood right now, but um, I wanted to point out that you for our physicians, you can get uh, CME credit. You'll receive an email and need to fill out an evaluation survey. And once you do that, you'll be able to receive a certificate. But this has to be done within 24 hours. Uh, we will be in touch about the next grand rounds. I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us and participating. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, thanks. Can you